It's December 15th, 2009. I'm Barbara Blake, and I'm talking to Mr. Jewel Wheatley here in Beaufort. So, Jewel, could we start off um, with you telling us what year you were born and what community did you grow up in? I was born in 1950, and I was born and raised in Beaufort. Okay, and your family was involved in the Menhaden industry for quite some time, right? Yes, my granddad, uh, when the Menhaden, when Fish Mill and Oil Company went bankrupt in the 34, my granddad and Mr. Potter uh, decided to take it over just for employment, because they employed so many people. They didn't do it because uh, Mr. Will Potter ran his own fish house, and my granddad was an attorney here in Beaufort. <laughs> But they did it basically for keep the fact because everything was done by hand. Everything was manual. Crews were 30, 35 person per boat. Uh, we probably employed 100, 150 people. So, so uh, they just decided to keep it going and they went ahead and took over the mortgage from Mr. Fairley Dickerson. Okay, so Mr. Fairley Dickerson? Had it first, had it before no, that? No, he, he was a banker in New Jersey. Oh, okay. And he was holding the note on it. And he and my granddad were friends. Okay. And so they assumed the mortgage. 1934, I think it was $50,000. How about that? And that was just right in the Depression years, wasn't it? Correct. So what was the name of the factory before it was Beaufort Fisheries? I think it was Taylor's Creek. Oh, I can't remember right now, Barbara. I think it was Taylor's Creek, Fish Mill and Oil, something like yeah. that. Yeah, okay. And what was your granddad's name? Claude Wheatley. So he was Claude, Claude Wheatley the first? Mm-hmm, senior. Senior, okay. So, here you come along, and you've got three brothers, right? Why was it you, of all the brothers, that stepped up and took up the reins of Boker Fisheries? Probably had something to do with intelligence. Mm -hmm. I probably wasn't the brightest light in the room. Because <laughs> you were educated at the Citadel, right? Correct. With, every, with all your other brothers. Yes. It was, it was just something that, uh, I don't know, it was one of those I was working for the bank at the time, and it was that was another recession, and what no, it's going on, and it was boring. Mm -hmm. So uh, I came and talked to my dad, and I talked to Mr. Piggy Potter, and his son wasn't interested. So I said, "Well, I'll give it a chance," and that was 1973, and. Uh, What a time. So what was your first uh, role when you started in 73? I went down there and <coughs> basically uh, learned the bookkeeping mm -hmm. from Miss Velma Lewis. She was the bookkeeper. And, uh, and then I started working on the boats, started going out of the boats. One of the first, I said, first one went on was Lee and Ann with Captain Charlie Pittman. And then I went on the uh, Pauline with uh, El Captain Elwood Willis. And then uh, we did a little sound fishing. And then I went to the factory with a dear friend of mine, Lonnie Nolan, who was a very, very intelligent uh, black fellow from uh, Harlow. One of my favorites, I would say. He was my favorite of all the people we down there. He's a mm -hmm. gentle giant. And smart he knew the cookers, dryers, centrifuges, boilers. He knew it all. He'd been down there. He didn't even know how old he was. Hmm. And uh, so I worked with him for about six months. He took me through how to do the cookers and the presses and the... Shakers, screens, the dryers, everything, boilers. 
And uh, he and I became dear friends. But anyway, that's what I basically did was just learn the business and then uh, went flying with, at that time, Dick Rod was our plane spotter. And uh, I used to go flying with him when he looked for fish and when he would uh, set the boats. And those were long days, eight hours in that airplane. Oh, my gosh. But anyway... But I, I kind of, first couple of years, just learned the business. And was that the intent? They said, all right, Jewel, give it a shot, but we want you to learn everything about it. You're going to work on the boats. You're going to know. Nobody that. told me anything. Really? Uh-uh. <laughs> Maybe that was a good thing. I did that all on my own. I just, if I was going to be in it, I wanted to make sure I couldn't. Be BS'd about this, that, and the other. Oh, that was good. So that was my reason. I was 23. And what did you do on the boats? Were you actually hauling in the nets and such? Yes. Really? Yes. How'd you I, like that? I did. Oh, well, they like to pull pranks on me. Like and, what? <laughs> well, they used to steer from the stern. I'm the one to move the steering up to the center console. But anyway... And I'd be about there with the captain, in particular in the winter time, it's so cold that those uh, nets would freeze with ice balls, salt water, and that come back and hit you, or you'd be out there pulling on the net. And I'm not gonna call his name, but one of those common said, "Stick your hands in the water or warm them up." And I did, and good, I couldn't hardly get up the ladder of the boat. Fingers frozen. I. <laughs> Shag, a, you remember him? They cooked. Yeah, he was a, he was a fisherman before he started cooking. I didn't know that. Oh my goodness. But anyway, <laughs> they get, they'd get me, and then uh, we went down to Sound, and I told them I, the only boat didn't have a fish pump on it was the Lennoxville. And I told Captain Mel, when I said I'll bail them if you'll take her down to Sound because of the fish show. Anyway, I bailed them. Every one of them. The hand bail method? Every last one of them. I don't sweat up my boots when we got through. You mean when you were off in the water with the crew, you were bailing them into the boat? Then we come alongside. Yeah, okay. Didn't have hard end rigs on her. And then the chanting would start of that hooping and hollering. I didn't know what in the world was going on. But anyway, that's what... Uh, and then, uh... Well, they had power blocks, didn't they? Uh-uh. In 73? Not, uh, this is about 75. Not on that boat. Wow. So that boat was sort of doing it the old timey way still. Well, I think they did have power blocks, but you still had, we didn't have a hardening rig. So you had the harder to fish. Is that where you bring the line down from the big boat and yes. it pulls it up? We didn't have that. So that's why the men still needed to sing. Whatever. They had to harden the fish. We had to harden the fish. Sorry. Oh, yeah. When they started at me, I said, what in the world's going on with Kael? What he said, well, I'm not going to tell you take what he said, but anyway. Did you join in singing? No, I didn't know what they were singing. <laughs> All I know was we had to hurry to get those fish because we were fishing in shallow water. And uh, it's not like you were in the ocean. We were in the sound, mm -hmm. six, seven, eight feet of water. And you never sand up. Then you'll lose it. And I said, my God, this pool, come on. Anyway, but that's, they had their way and that was it. Were you fishing in the Straits there by Harper's Island? No, as a matter of fact, we're fishing in Bears Bay. Oh, you're way on around. Mm -hmm, down to Atlantic Cedar Island. Yeah, huh. I never knew that you started that way, Jewel, in all these years. That's a lot you don't know. <laughs> all right, so at what point did you step up and, and start running the whole business? Well, Miss Lewis, Miss Velma, was probably the sweetest lady I ever met. She retired about, well, I want to say 76, 77. And that's when I had to go in and 
start doing all the bookkeeping, the payrolls, the billings for fish meal, keeping up with uh, the fish catch. Uh, Was Piggy still in charge at that point? Yeah. Uh, but uh, he was in charge. When did he? Did he just decide to retire one day? No. Well, we won't go. It was a big court case. Oh, okay. I didn't know. All right, we don't have to talk about that. No, we had a locked up board and and uh, but he was a character. My goodness gracious, what a character! Mm -hmm. A lot of people didn't when we had that fight. That me and Mr. Potter were good friends. Right on, uh, even though uh, we had that little disagreement, we, we that was a bond there. And, uh, but the fishing business was just, I, I tell you, getting back to the nuts and bolts of everything, the Menhaden industry is probably the toughest industry in the United States. It's, uh, the regulatory people, one time I spoke to the North Carolina historians, writers or whatever they were, and I made a list back in the mid-80s. I answered to 38 regulatory people. Nuclear power plants don't have to answer to that many people. That's probably about all the regulatory people there are. That's everybody. And then, you, and then when you go from North Carolina, we fished. Georgia, then South Carolina put a net ban. We couldn't fish South Carolina. We had to bypass South Carolina. And then Georgia said, even though they didn't have a net ban, they wouldn't issue me a license later. And then uh, Maryland uh, closed their waters. Cause we, and then uh, Delaware closed. Del uh, then we started fishing off New Jersey and uh, Virginia. And then New Jersey closed its waters. And then we were left with uh, North Carolina and North Carolina, and that bunch of idiots we sent to that legislature every year kept coming in with more restrictions. So I spent a lot of my time, most of my time, fighting to keep uh, uh, areas open. It was a never ending battle. And then, uh, and then you had the sports fishing crowd trying to ban. See, the theory was if we could ban menhaden, we could get all the commercial fishing. That was our whole theory. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, I fought and fought and fought and and uh, and basically we won, we won, we won because we were right and they were wrong. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's just like that idiot down in Brunswick County that put the net ban in on Menhaden. There's no Menhaden plants. I mean, he should have just passed a bill, pigs can't fly. I mean, you know, that's how smart that bill was. I mean, when you have to deal with idiots like I had to deal with, people like that continuously. And, and really, the, the only person that, that, would, that I had as a, an accomplice up there was Jean Preston. Mm -hmm. In our first fight, she was a freshman, but she did a hell of a job. We uh, we stopped it, what, four or five, six times. But then you had it everywhere. You had, uh, even though the no lab, the scientists were probably most helpful to us, uh, we still had certain things we had to, on the uh, AMAC, Atlantic Menhaden Advisory Committee. And then you had the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Menhaden Division. We had to, it was a never ending battle that. Matter of fact, what I think three years ago, they threw all industry off that board. I reckon, I reckon that was a smart thing to do, throw the Menhaden industry off the Menhaden board or to throw doctors off medical boards. Lawyers of bar associations. Yeah. I mean, that's how the, the smart they are, and that's what I had to deal with continuously. Wasn't there a legislator that thought they had a real odd idea of how you catch menhaden? 
with the use of the airplanes. Yeah. Who was the, what was Who, that? Uh, Bonner Stiller, wasn't it? I don't remember. Drop nets out of the airplanes or something. Uh huh. These are the idiots I had to put up with continuously, and then, and then I had to deal. See, when I first came in the industry in 1973. They just started invoking the Clean Water Act and the air quality. And there was absolutely nothing at Beaufort Fisheries that we did that would be polluting. As a matter of fact, uh, our bail water, the most, probably the most liberal state in the world is California. And they make their uh, processors dump their, when they a gut and clean fish back overboard. They make them, mm-hmm. put the nutrients back in the water. North Carolina, no, we, we can't, we aren't allowed to do that. I mean, and here I am, what, a half mile from the inlet. So, I mean, that's what we had to deal with. And uh, the bureaucrats, my God, that, it, it wasn't any fun. What were the heyday years for you, Jewel, was managing that company? I think the first heyday year was 19, when I, the year I took over president general manager in 1983, and everybody giving the industry up for dead. And then uh, we pulled it off. And then, in, but the worst was in 85, 86. I think that's when you came down and started writing that book of yours. And uh, when fish meal got down, at that time it cost about $300 a ton to produce fish meal. And I got a call from Holly Farms, they had been offered fish meal at that time from Zapata Haney at $125 a ton. That's losing $175. So every time, the more fish you caught, the more money you lost. That was probably the worst of the. Because uh, no matter how hard you work, you're going to lose more money. The harder you work, the more money you lost. Because when I got here, I think it was in 86, um, the year before, you had kept the boats tied up because the price of meal was so low. And then we opened, we leased two fish houses. And you remember that. I do. And now I'm going to tell you something. Those days were 24-7 sleeping on fish boxes, just trying to get enough cash flow to keep the creditors from from throwing us into bankruptcy. And then about 1989-90, we hit a hung run those years. We didn't make any money. The stock, see the stock, here, here's the funny thing, the stockholders never made any money out of the face factor. The, uh, but uh, we hit, we made enough money to pay everybody off, including the bank, and put some cash reserves away. How about that? But they didn't last long. See, our price is based on soybeans and corn. And of course, both those peat processors or producers, they get subsidies. We didn't get any subsidies. We get, as a feed ingredient to poultry and swine, we, uh, we're in competition with them. That's what our price is based on. And if we got too high, then uh, the nutritionists at these feed plants would uh, just take fish meal out the formula. Mm-hmm. And once you're out the formula, it's hard as hell to get back in it. Out of the formula? Uh-huh. What would they replace you with? Bone meal, blood meal, stuff like that. High protein stuff. So in the years that you sort of snatched victory from the jaws of defeat when you became the president and then the years that you hit that home run, what do you attribute that to? Were the prices good? Was the fishing especially good? Oh, yeah. The way you can hit a home run fish meal business is the price has got to be good. Yeah. You can catch yourself bankrupt. I mean, that's when, you know, the price loading, you see the boats come in, and everybody's singing and dancing. I'm sitting there crying, oh, God, how much did I lose today? But, uh, and it, it was, uh, it, it, like I say, it's a tough, 
You don't remember Joe Humphreys with Standard Products? No. Big Joe Hoss, they called him. He always had a plug in the back of his mouth. Can't know where he's wore bib overalls. And he kind of had to run PEX plants. And he was between uh, Reedville and Mississippi all the time, Virginia. Anyway, he came in there and he says, they always call me the squire, I don't know why. The squire? Yeah. <laughs> and he says, squire? I said, oh, but God damn, if I ain't seen more bad times in this industry and I have good. And I said, well, you're about right. And it's tough. Yeah, so when meal prices got good, what was good a ton? How much was it about? When it got between 450 and 500. Okay. It's just a thousand now. A thousand a ton now. But you gotta realize uh, processing costs have gone up tremendously. You know, when I, when I first started, we were using Bunker C three cents a gallon. The freight from Wilmington cost more than the, than the load of fuel. And then it got up there. Then we had to go, then the air quality people maybe go to a number four and then diesel. And, you know, your cost doubled and then, then you had these damn. I, I think probably the most disheartening thing to me in the fishing business is when the unions came in. I couldn't believe those fellas turned on me. What year was that? Let's see, this is 9-6. About 2003, 2002, 2004, somewhere around there. So it was really shortly before you shut That's the right. Doors. Yeah. They shut themselves down, if you want to put the... They, they, they took all the wind out of my sails when they, when they turned on me. Well, did everybody join the union? The factory didn't. Who the did? The factory voted the boats. Oh. And it was a bad union, and uh, they were taking advantage of it, and I had to negotiate. It cost us a lot of money and uh, that we didn't have. But it kind of, you know, after, you know, you loan them money, bail them out of jail, pay the child support. I mean, and then here comes a fellow from Landover, Maryland, don't, know, don't like them, don't care about them, call them derogatory names in my office, and then they went with him. Everybody on the boats voted yes? Most of the blacks. And so when that happens, do all the crewmen have to join the union? No. Did any white guys join? No. And none of the black ones paid any union dues. So how can you pay them more than... You don't pay them more. I didn't pay them more. What did they get out Nothing. of... Nothing. set of boots. Really? That's all they got. Hmm. I mean, they wanted, I had to negotiate. It, it, it was absolutely... And, and I'm telling you, it wasn't me. It was Mr. Humphreys, Peck Humphreys. Mm -hmm. uh, all the industry. When they got that crowd, they just... We're not putting up with this. We got enough to put up with without this bunch of fools. What was the name of the union? It was some food. <coughs> they were part of the AFL-CIO, mm -hmm. but it was that food workers mess. Uh, and are they all unionized now, even in the Gulf? Mm-hmm. They are? I didn't know that. And uh, Head of the union I had to deal with was a boy named Kenny Pinkard. He was a cook on one of the men Hague boats up in Virginia. Sitting there telling them. They got nothing but a set of $18 boots. And they didn't like them, so they were wearing them. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was just the attitude. Yeah. And then that was bad, but probably the worst is when all my old uh, black uh, and I would say gentlemen when they started dying off and retiring on me. Yeah. Because I couldn't find, 
you, any dependent drugs have taken over everything. Yeah. I mean, it just, it was, it was awful. Who were some of the old guys yeah. that you depended on so much? Oh God, Zeke Merle, Ross Good, William Bryant, as I said before, Lonnie Nolan. Uh, let's see, who do I leave out? We had a bunch of them. I, Ernest? Yeah, oh gosh, yes. Ernest Merle? Murray. Murray, Ernest Murray. He was another favorite. He, uh, if you don't cook the fish right, they're not going to end up right. There's nothing you can do, and he always. I think one of the, the uh, I just put Bobo on the pool and sent him to New Jersey or Virginia. I can't remember which, but it, New Jersey, I think. Could have been that. I can't remember. But anyway, we went and sent to send him to the north, and uh, don't not come home with that boat was loaded. We were broke. I spent every dime on refrigeration. But anyway, so uh, he comes in, refrigeration broke down, circulation, what the damn. But anyway, so, uh, you know, it was just sloshed. And he was loaded. Loaded. So my superintendent said, we can't process those fish. They're too rotten. You got to dump it. See, I said, be damn. So I went up over to the raw box, and Ernest Murray was up there. And I never saw him, he didn't have his Bible with him. And he'd been up, that Bible had been up there in so much steam, which was about two inches, was now about six inches. The pages had swelled up on him, but he marked off me. Hell of a nice guy. But anyway, I said, Ernest, can you process these fish? He said, boss man, it's that young fella's job to catch them, and it's my job to cook them. Now, he's done his job, and I plan on doing mine. I said, thank you. Okay. I said, put the hose on them, boys, and we processed them. Mm -hmm. We stunk up both are pretty good. They were a little rotten, but that's all right. <laughs> I miss that smell. I do, too. But uh, it was, uh, they, they, you know, you, you think about when you manage a Mid Hayden factory, you got to deal with scientists, marine biologists, then you got nutritionists in the feed mills, and they're all got PhDs in nutrition. And then you got to deal with bankers, then you got to deal with brokers. Then you got to deal with, one time we had to deal with the Chicago Feed Exchange up there, that crowd. And then you got to deal with the fishermen. Then you got to deal with all the bureaucrats and the fisheries people. And uh, you see, my problem, I had to wear so many hats. Mm -hmm. Then I had to serve on all those commissions just to protect ourselves. Yeah, you were, you really worked hard in that. And, uh... Then I came up with that moratorium steering committee idea, and everybody said I sold them down the river. It saved their butts. And I've had a few fish dealers call me up and say, Joe, thank God you didn't listen to us. I said, well, I mean, it was, it was a tough game. And uh, but you got to be, be tough skin to get in this business. And then you also had your 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 board of the company, right, to deal. You had a lot of different people to answer to or to deal with. So what what do you think was the straw that broke the cam camel's back when you just finally decided this is it? I think when we wrecked the boat and we missed a season and it cost us well over a million dollars. And then, as I said, my, my people were, some of them, some of them were good, particularly, but in, but in the factory, some of them were bad. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and then the boat sunk, and my family, they weren't getting any money out of them, they were getting this grunnel, and I said, and now, and I looked at all those fisheries meetings, and 
I had uh, family problems, and uh, so when they wanted to close, they closed her. And I figured it would be the best time to get the best price. I knew that the price was as high as it's ever going to be. And I said, hey, we're going to go, let's go. You mean the real estate price? Yes. You were right about that, weren't you? Lucky. How do you feel when you drive by that place now? I don't go by it much. Yeah. I don't go by it much. I mean, it's... uh. I did notice he hasn't torn down the roll box yet, or where the and over where the cooker was. Mm -hmm. But it was it was good for a lot of people. I mean, it uh, it's always funny to me. The owners made the least when she was operating. They're the ones that made all the sacrifice. They're the ones that get, hell. I didn't get paid for two years. That's amazing. But every one of them got paid. Overtime. And then I had the uh, IRS because I couldn't pay withholding taxes. And heck, he's retired now, so I can tell it. And he and I got in a knockdown, drag out fight. And uh, he said, he'll take me to jail. I said, I've developed claustrophobia. You're not big enough to get handcuffs on me. He said, well, I'm going to give you some deputies. I said, okay, but you, I, you can bet your sweet ass you'll not find me when you get back. <laughs> he turned out to be my best creditor. All right, the internal revenue. Really? <laughs> my best creditor. He carried me for, oh, gosh. I want to say at least six, eight, nine months. Sure did. You know, I've got really good friends. He trusted me. I, I mean, he had me. I mean, what I did was wrong. I just couldn't pay withholding tax. It was a trust account. He didn't think much of it when I first told him they shouldn't have trusted me. But anyway, but uh, <laughs> but he ended up, that's funny. When you say the IRS was your best uh, creditor. Yeah. But he was. <laughs> and he was a sports fisherman from Wilmington. Really? Well, I remember you telling me once, it didn't matter who the person was, whether they're sport fishermen or recreate or commercial fishermen or bankers or creditors, it all came down to people. You know, there are people that you could work with. You know, Barbara, I never, when I say never, I never signed a contract with people I dealt with. Holly Farms. Tyson, uh, Ampro Thieves down in uh, Georgia, H.J. Baker, never signed a contract. Um, Atlantic Shippers, uh, that was Pierre Petru's crowd, never signed. I sold him when Price got up one time. I was at a buddy's house and I got a call. And they said, the call such and such. And Sapata had taken all their fish meal off the market. So uh, I called up Pierre Petru of the International Protein Corporation. I said, Mr. Petru, you'll buy some fish meal for the fall, subject to production. I'm the only one that got subject to production. He said, how much? I said, I'll sell you 500 tons at 490. I said, okay. So I'll sell you another 500 tons at 500. Okay. I'll sell you another 500 tons at 510. He said, that's getting too high. He's a Egyptian and French, French, Egyptian, anyway, whatever, whatever you want to call that nationality, I don't know. But uh, he was a good friend of mine. And I said, I'll tell you what, and then we'll do a thousand tons right at 500. Mm -hmm. So, so then, uh, so if you think about it, that was, So that was a couple million dollars right there. 
over the phone. And where was he based? He was in New Jersey then. He had, he had a fish factory down in the Gulf. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. So you like to go with gentlemen's agreements? Yep. That was signed a contract. And when you said subject to production, that means that if I didn't make if I didn't make it, there was no penalty. How about that? And people went along with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure did. And uh, I've had companies. Uh, We'd be a little short on money. Every Manhattan company is always short on money. And uh, I said, look, can you advance me uh, $300,000? I got payroll coming up. They said, yes. Yeah. I said, well, can you FedEx and get it to me tomorrow by noon? Yes. And they do it. I've had, uh, like Holly Farms, how big they are, what were, before they got taken over by Tyson. But, uh, I was sitting there one day, I called my friend up named John Wilson. He was a buyer. I said, John, I got a payroll coming about $150,000. I don't have any money, and I got you, and y'all owe me that. I mean, the trucks were on the way. The trucks ain't got there. He said, okay, we'll send you a check. And he'd walk that check right through that multi-billion dollar corporation for us. Wow. So you got some good people to work with. Mm -hmm. Sure did. They trusted me, and I trusted them. Well, and didn't Beaufort Fisheries have the reputation of having some of the highest quality meal in the world? Well, the, the meal was not the, high, not, not the meal because our fish weren't as oily in the summer. Mm -hmm. What we did have the reputation is the best fish oil. William Bryant was the best fish oil man there was. And we made the best fish oil of any company. And when he left, our quality went all to hell. Mm. But he knew fish oil. Why did he leave? He got burned up with the, uh, he was uh, cleaning his oil equipment. And he put it in the cleaner solution when it was hot. He's only, he's only been there about 50 years. He always got away with it, except this time. And we had to put him in the burn center at Chapel Hill for about a month, six weeks, something like that. Oh, my gosh. And he never came back. Yeah. But we don't want to go there. But you took care of him. Oh, yeah. Yeah, put his family up. Oh, oh yeah. That's there. Yeah. So what do you miss most about the fish factory? What I miss most of those old timers down there. I had done some, it used to be fun to go to work down there. It was fun. That crowd, what a crowd. But uh, it was getting bad at the end. It was getting bad, regulations. Uh, I dare say we could probably even operate it now with the regulations coming down. Mm -hmm. It's just, it, I, I just can't, you, let me tell you something else. When I pulled that factory out in 1983, 84, in 85 and 86, 87. A friend of mine named Captain Lynn Lowry, one of the top captains on the, he's a legend on Chesapeake Bay. And he and I got to be good friends. And he called me up one night. Now he could do some cussing when he got mad. He says, son, you know the only reason you survived the rest of them couldn't? I said, I don't have a clue, Captain Lynn, why? He said, youth. Said the old man couldn't stand. And he is exactly right. There's no way you can work 24 hours, seven days a week and pulling and tugging and hauling and doing the things. And, well, I'll be perfectly honest with you. 
I don't believe today, knowing what I know now, I could talk to people and get away with the way I talk to those legislatures in those sessions and go to Washington, D.C. and talk in those board meetings and, and call them a bunch of no good SOBs. I don't believe I could get away with it today. I don't know. Because <laughs> it was. I don't know. That was a stressful job, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Look at me. I look 100. I think you look pretty good. You look like you've been relaxing a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Hair's jet black, too. It, it's not falling out. <laughs> well, did Bobo play a role in helping you be successful in those early years? Yeah. He, uh... Yes, I think he did. <laughs> I said, Bobo, I need three loads of fish out of Southport. Nobody's ever done that before. I said, I know it. Well, I got to have him to make payroll. So it was always a struggle. And he did it. He'd bring me three loads. Is that going to get us right? Yeah, I'll keep doing that. Matter of fact, Bobo, when I shut down, when the price got so bad, I heard he came to me. He said, Jewel, you got to let us go back fishing. He said, all we're doing is laying here on the shore, idle, getting in trouble and laying drunk. That's all we're all doing. Put us back to work. I said, Bob, I don't know if I can pay you. We don't care if you pay us or not. I said, but I'm telling you, I don't know if I can make payroll. He said, we don't care. We're going fishing. I said, okay, go fishing. That next week we're fishing. I made payroll, too. And he loaded. Yeah, but I made payroll. (laughs) I sure did. I got it somehow. Yeah. But, uh, oh, yeah, it was uh, it was fun. And then, like I say, the union destroyed everything. The union, when it came in, it kind of, uh, everybody's attitude, everybody's. The cat and Bob, everybody got, uh, I don't have to, that's not my job and that kind of crap. When the boat's sinking, you better somebody better find a job. You know, you just uh, it just the union screwed up the Menhaden industry. I'll say that in a nutshell. They brought it on themselves. Something for nothing. And they were also not factoring in the things that you used to do for the employees that went way above and beyond the call of duty, right? Oh yes. So they blackmailed me on that, the union did. It's all right. Well, what are, what are some of the things? I remember you used to bring people to the doctor and sure. all, all sorts of stuff. Did you really bail people out? Yes. <laughs> yeah, God almighty. I'll never forget, I don't want to call his name, but he had a mental problem. And he hadn't taken his medicine. So he came in fishing. And nobody could do anything with him. He cratered in hell. And uh, right after Christmas. And they had to take him to a new mental health clinic. Well, he wouldn't go with anybody but me. So I said, come on, Wendell. He was an assistant manager. I said, come on, go with me. I said, I'm not going with you. I'll quit if I get in that car with that crazy thing. And I said, okay, I said, get in the car. He get in the car. I said, boss, let me show what I got for Christmas. Now here he is crazy now. Pulls out one of them Rambo knives. Me right foot of the boat for bridge. I said, put that knife up. You think I'd stick you? I said, put that knife up. And he put it up, and I said, give me that nap, and I threw it right in the back of that stagy wagon. So I took it to the new mental health clinic, and I, he got his prescription. I said, come on, we went and got it filled. I had to pay for that. I said, now take them. I wouldn't let him in the car till he took them. Anyway, I mean, it was... He was a fisherman? Huh? He was a fisherman? Crazy. Oh, yeah, take wheel. Always take the... That was a normal thing, taking that crowd to a damn doctor. But anyway. All right. What else? Well, Jewel, is there anything you'd like to add about your whole career in the Menhaden industry? 
it was it was uh, it was fun. It was tough. It was uh, met a lot of people. A lot of people know me. Made a lot of publications. Mm-hmm. One time, I was in every sports fishing magazine from. At, uh, Linwood Parker called me a Parker Marine. He said, buddy, so saving all these magazines, you've made every editorial page in them. I said, okay. But, uh, you know, made a lot of friends, a lot of people. And uh, I, I think being on the marine fisheries, I made more friends in that than anything else because I could have sold the commercial fish industry down the river numerous times to protect the menhaden industry. Mm-hmm. And they all trust me. They're the ones that called me, talked me into going to the Mid-Atlantic Fisheries Council it was a crowd from Dare County. They trust me. Well, what do you think about Beaufort now that there's no industry here? Do you think closing down has changed the character of Beaufort? Well, it's like a f- realtor told me. He said he had a fella came in from, I can't remember where he said, Philadelphia or somewhere, and he was steaming his boat down. He said, I've never seen, he said, this is the most unique community I've ever seen. There you got a stinking fish factory, he said, down there, and he's putting out smoke, and there you look down there, million dollar homes, and everybody's getting along. Said I can't, this is the most unique community I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. Said I just don't, I just can't believe it. But see, my problem was I knew I had to be active in everything. The boy will tell you it'll wear you down. Yeah. Like drive to Washington D.C. and back the same day because I had to be there or leave a fisheries meeting in Elizabeth City at eleven o'clock at night and have to drive home, the, back then it was about four and a half hour drive, and then be at the office at seven o'clock in the morning. Mm-hmm. It's just, uh, well you saw what we did when you were down there. Yep. It was, of course you'd have been dead now had it been for the factory with his nabs and coats. <laughs> you'd have been anorexic. You guys took good care of me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any story that you'd like to share before you go? I can't remember any. Okay, well, if you think any, let me know. We'll do this again. I, I did love it back when Pet Conference was running and those Virginia boats would come down. What was that like? They were fun. I, 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 they were uh, Captain Henry Dixon. You remember him? I remember the name. And then uh, Slick. I mean, I have... Uh, I tell you one thing, Beaufort did well when they were there, mm-hmm. particularly the restaurants and the uh, bars and stuff. Mm-hmm. They did very well. What was the story you told me about one of the captains from um, Virginia drove all the way down here to knock on your door and make sure you were okay? What, what that was, was Captain you? Lynn Lowry. What happened there? It was just bad. It was just bad, bad times. I mean, he knew how bad it was up there. And he called me up when I had just got home. It was a Saturday night. He said, how's it going? I said, not good, Lynn. Not good. And he said, are you going to make it? I said, damn, if I know if I'm going to make it or not. I said, I don't know. Everybody else is going busted. He said, okay, buddy, hang in there. About 6 o'clock in the morning, come knocking on the apartment door. What do you want? I can't do it. God damn it. You upset me all night. <laughs> so, went to the sanitary and got him some lunch and I sent his butt home. And he said he drove all that way, why? He worried about me. Yeah. So I didn't want you to do anything stupid. I ain't suicidal man. <laughs> it ain't that bad. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, it was... You look at it, a lot of a lot of factories went broke during those times. Yeah. I mean, Peck left, Sea and Sound left. You see, when all those left, 
we could kind of spread the bureaucrats around. They all came to me then to justify their jobs. Mm -hmm. I got every one of them. Everyone. I even got a call one day from Air Quality. I'm just sitting here thinking how aggravating they were. And said somebody was down at the Beaufort Drawbridge and could smell ammonia. And I was the only one that had ammonia refrigeration. I said, his name was Bill Cochran. From, and I liked him. And I said, Bill, the wind is southwest. It's blowing to the northeast. That bridge is west of me. The only way they could smell if I had ammonia leak, you had to go all the way around the world and come back. Now, don't aggravate me anymore. And then he got, then he get mad. I mean, that's just that's just one example of a thousand. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't talk to me like that. You know, it's just I'm just hang the phone up. Yeah. You know, it's and then it's just like uh, Rick Rick Shriver, water quality. The last time we operated, he came down to that factory 15 days, including Saturday and Sunday. 15 straight days harassing me. Straight days in a row? In a row. I finally locked him out. And uh, on Sunday, make a long story short, he turned me into the attorney general's office. They sent a lawyer down here. And I was sitting on the docks, and they were telling me how to fix that roll box. And I asked that lawyer from the attorney general's office, I said, where in the hell are you from? He said, Ron, I said, no. His name was something, something, Obi. I said, no, nobody with a name like that was born and raised. Where'd you come from? Nairobi. I said, well, how many roll boxes did y'all have in Nairobi? None. I said, now, Rick, this is the first raw box you, you and Nairobi have ever seen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you're telling, I've been looking at it for 35 years. <laughs> Hello? I just asked him, I said, what are y'all, I mean, why are y'all sitting here telling me about a raw box and y'all have never seen one before? And I looked at old Nairobi. I said, yeah, you just like every other goddamn dog. You know everything about, I said, you don't know. I said, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell y'all something. In Nairobi, you can hear me. Don't come down here tomorrow. Now, do not come down here. You're not going to like it. And I meant it to. Mm -hmm. They had harassed me. But that was normal. They didn't show up the next day either. But that was... That's what happens when... Uh, you're the only game in town. So when it got to the point when the realtors were coming around and you're getting ready to do that, was that a relief? Was that a mix? Did you have mixed feelings about that? No, when I make my mind up, it's made up. Yeah. When I make my mind up, it's, it's made up. Was it hard to tell everybody? Yeah. That was the unfair part. They made me do it. When How'd they voted to do it. How'd you tell? Just told them. Just... I don't think my bedside manner was very good, but uh, how do you, I mean, you know, how do you tell them? Yeah. They kind of knew it. I think everybody knew when the boat sunk that it was, it was nails in the coffin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We lost a million dollars. Mm. But anyway. All right, Jewel. Well, I appreciate you taking the time. Okay. This interview. And I'll just add what I miss most about the factory is just going down there and seeing everybody. And not just people that work there, but all those old fellows that would come into your office and sit and shoot the breeze. That was that was a gathering place. Tell me about it. It was uh I tell you though, uh really truly though. The worst thing that's ever hit in this country is drugs. Yeah. It's, and I don't know what to do about it. It's, I don't know of a family it hasn't touched. Mm -hmm.
nobody's immune to it. And uh, I've had some, oh God, some, some, some great workers and they get on it and it, it's terrible what it does to them, what they turn into. Mm -hmm. It's none of it good. But anyway, that's, uh, I don't know what I'm going to do. That's right, I'm getting bored of that. <laughs> well, at least you're still on some fisheries commission boards and such, right? It's the first time I've ever been on a board of any type. I don't know what the hell they're talking about. I don't even know what species they're eating. I've never seen these type of fish. You're in the mid-Atlantic, right? Yes. So they're talking about scup. Tile fish and, <laughs> and, you know, and they, uh, squid and uh, Atlantic mackerel. And uh, I just sit down. Turn it off. All right. I Thank did. you, Jewel.